Okay, um, got a few people joining here. Let me know if you can hear me. I better get my chat open here. There we go. So yeah, you guys are here right now. Let me know if you can hear me and see the my desktop. <clears throat> So anybody, give me a little feedback, tell me whether I'm, whether you can see the desktop and you can hear me here. Yes, we can okay. hear you. All right, great. You. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> or you can raise your hand on there. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, uh, well. So, I mean, as usual, these are meant to be kind of help sessions. Uh, I've got a few things I, I can talk about, um, um, but uh, the, for those that are participating kind of live, if you have questions on your mind, feel free to start throwing them out or throw them out anytime. I've seen some people are working on the uh, first assignment, which, you know, as a reminder is due on Wednesday. <laughs> which is good um oh, uh, yeah sorry professor um so uh for the written assignment uh one of the problems uh the ac comes out to be a negative number yep. so so i was wondering how do you exactly i know for negative you have to write one in the beginning so let's say the number is zero 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 five and you want to write that in negative so would it be one with three zeros and five, or would it be one with two zeros and five? Well, um, let's um, let's look at that. So we just I discussed that a little bit in the um, uh, description of the assignment. Let's see here. Actually, I got all the assignments. Oh no, those are all the programming assignments. Uh, let me bring up the written assignment here. Just a moment. So, um, if you read our textbook, um, the, um, I mean, it, it does give um, a format for that, although in the examples in the textbook, it doesn't re really use that, okay? So, and if you've taken our, our previous course on uh, machine architecture, you know, you should have gotten a little bit of this. Um, so, but, but this is the definition of our format. So, our, our hypothetical machine has 16-bit uh, words. Um, and to represent integers, we use the whole word, um, well, well, we use the first bit as a sign bit, uh, and then the other 15 bits give the magnitude, right? So, you know, to get this right, to represent a negative number, you have to, and, and I think as I asked, um, you should, um, <clears throat> Uh, in our version, I, I know I gave some extra information here, but um, uh, where is the fall 2020 version here? I need that. Uh, oh, I know. And that's what I was looking for. This should be the version I've got posted up there with some additional kind of 
information instructions um, on, on uh, using things here. So, um, so kind of as I said on the last paragraph here, it is possible for it to end up with a negative number. Um, so you might have like uh, in, in the previous class, you might have talked about there. So there's different ways you can represent negative numbers. So it's more common to use like a like a one or two's complement here. So the, the, the format defined uh, in our hypothetical machine is, is somewhat simpler than that. So, um, you know, so what two's complement is normally used because this, this format, for example, there's two ways to represent zero. So you can have all these bits be zero for the magnitude and, and have a zero for the sign bit. So you have like a plus zero, or you could have a one for a sign bit, and, and that gives you like a negative zero, right? Um, but but anyway, I mean that that's our defined format here. So uh, yeah, I mean if you have negative five, you just need to you should display it as a hexadecimal number. So you have to represent your your binary uh, correctly as as a hex number. So this is just, this is kind of a review of um, some stuff that um, I hope kind of people know about, but, but yeah, you know, so, so if I have a binary number like, um, so five is what, uh, so for 16 bits, so I, I might have eight bits, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so five in a bit pattern is uh, uh, two to the two, which is four, uh, not any two to the ones, and then two to the zero, right, so that, that's a five in binary, right, so negative five is simply where you have a one out there um, as in the sign bit. So that's your negative five representation, all right? So yeah, so, so that, that, uh, that in hexadecimal is kind of how, however, you know, you have to get your magnitude correct, whatever the, the value is, the magnitude is the negative number, you have to, and then you just have to change your sign bit um, and, and give that as a hexadecimal number correctly um, to represent a negative number here. Okay, so well, one more question, Professor. Sure. So in our, um, the, the homework where you write the, the AC numbers and the IR, should they be in binary? I'm kind of confused. No. Um, I mean, the, the, it, it's maybe a little bit tough to, to realize, but these values are actually all hexadecimal, even in the textbook. So the textbook doesn't emphasize that, but, but these all represent, a, because that, that should be something that you realize and understand, because we're told that this is a 16, you know, all words are 16 bits, okay? So mm -hmm. every, every digit in a hexadecimal number represents four bits. So, so, so the reason why these are all uh, four digits in length, because these are four hexadecimal digits in each one. So this represents the, the, the bits 0, 0, 0, 1. And then this is the bit pattern for a, um, um, a, a nine, right? So for four bits, you can represent values from zero up to 16, or sorry, 15, zero up to 15, right? So anyway, that's the bit pattern for nine and so on, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't make a difference when, for example, for your accumulator, uh, if your values are positive. So, so whether you think of that as a decimal or a hexadecimal number, you kind of get the same result. I mean, well, that's not true. So, if you have a result, if I, if I, and I, I don't know, I don't know if I did this. I don't think I did. But if I, if you had a result of a calculation that was bigger than uh, nine, then, then yeah, it, it should have technically be represented as a hexadecimal, so it would have been like 000A zero, zero, zero for 10, for example, right? Uh, but, but it'll definitely make a difference for, for negative numbers because with the sign bit out there, you're gonna have to um, have a particular kind of format for the, in hexadecimal that correctly represents having the sign bit set to one uh, so that you have a negative number there. Okay, uh, so uh, um, um, just to be clear, so sure. if, if, if it's a negative number, let's say uh, it's zero, 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 0001, and I want to represent it in negative, so would it be 1, zero, zero, 001? Yeah, except for 1 with uh, 1 at the, at the 
at the 15th bit and a one just down here, right? So, so you have one with 14 zeros in between and then one at, at the other bit. So that's a negative one, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so I, I was mainly thinking about, you know, kind of going over um, the, the problem set since I'm sure that's on people's minds. Um, so yeah, keep question, keep asking questions about that if you have them. So, so yeah, we, I mean, I did throw a few other things. So besides the negative numbers, um, I did add a jump instruction in there. So you need to figure out how jumps work. So again, in the problem set that I gave you, I think I described it a little bit, but basically the main characteristics of, of a jump instruction is when you execute a jump instruction, so, so like a load or a store instruction, um, it does something to the accumulator. So it either uh, moves a value from memory into the accumulator or moves a value from the accumulator into memory, right? And, and likewise, adds and subtracts are also gonna be doing stuff with the accumulator. But a jump instruction does something with the program counter, right? So, so if you execute a jump instruction, um, you're, you're gonna be modifying the program counter with a new with the new location in memory of the next instruction that you need to execute. So. But that's the basics of, of a jump instruction. <coughs> and another thing some people had asked about, again, I described it a little bit in here, but um, you know, if, if, um, if you're executing for, for one of these problems, there's only like four problems, I think, um, and um, so, but I only gave you three instructions. So it is possible that you execute, you know, the, the first instruction, the fetch and execute of it, uh, and then that takes you to the next instruction, and then you execute the next instruction, fetch and execute it, and then you execute the third instruction, fetch and execute it, and, and at that point it's possible that your program counter has been set to 303, but you're not given the instruction for 303. So in that case, you're done, right? So, so if your program counter ever points to a memory address 303 or some memory address that you don't have, then you don't have any, you don't have an instruction to fetch. And so you have nothing to do at the next step, right? Um, but the other, th uh, the other thing that can occur, so since we have jump instructions here, it's also possible that you execute these instructions and then you get down, fill out, fill out the fetch and execute for step seven and eight here, your fourth fetch and execute. Uh, and then your program counter is still back to like 300 or 301 or something. So you could potentially keep going. Um, and in fact, it's probably gonna be an infinite loop if that's the case, but you can stop. So basically once you've filled out all eight of these, you don't, you don't have to do any more for this problem, just, just fill out. So, so normally you're gonna either fill out the first six or you might fill out the first eight um, sometimes. All right, so other questions? So it's, it's important that you kind of understand this because the first uh, program assignment, uh, we're gonna be implementing this hypothetical machine uh, in simulation, so. So, um, I mean, I was planning on maybe doing a little bit more of that on Wednesday, but I'll be happy to kind of look at that uh, a bit today as well, the, the, the program. Um, if people are starting to think about that. I mean, you definitely should start thinking about that and get working on it. So at this point, I think I've got everybody's gotten their dev box environment up, or at least almost everybody, which is good. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll go through the announcements here and kind of discuss these. So hopefully everybody's reading the announcements. I get a lot of evidence that people aren't reading, that the, they don't read the announcements enough, closely enough like they should, and uh, don't, don't read the instructions on the assignments um, and aren't watching the videos. So you shouldn't be using all the materials. Um, <clears throat> So, 
so yeah, getting back to the the assignment, um, um, I might I might occasionally have to update or fix something. So if I tell you to do a git pull, you should do that. Uh, in this case, um, um, my instruction on that was if you do a git pull, um, so the the video the the you know the example assignment that I gave. Um, uh, on the video, it was really for another class. So there's a few things that are slightly different. Um, and uh, I wish I had time to, to remake that video, but um, um, I, I just didn't have enough time to, to make separate videos for everybody. So in particular, uh, let's bring up a terminal here. So, so let me just kind of, uh, for the people that are on the, uh, the help session here, I, I did update that. So if you did do the git poll, um, so if, if you change into your repo, you can do this either on your dev box, or you can do that uh, on your host machine. But any, anytime I tell you there's some fixes or some updates, you can just go in there and do a git poll. Uh, it should work uh, either place to, to allow you to, to poll um, and, and get changes here. Um, the main one that I talked about was um, I updated for the, the, the um, our class here, hopefully I got the name right, um, but you should have a, a dev box reference for CSCI 430 that actually reflects the, the, the build system commands that you can do. So for 430, you can, do, um, you can do make clean and you can do make or make all, but you can do make test, make sim, um, or make tests to run all the unit tests. So it's a little bit different from what I had but these are the correct ones for 4.30 here. Um, and another thing that I had in that announcement, so if you, So if, if you do a make like I showed in the, the video the, for the, you know, the example uh, assignment, um, for 430, there is a kind of a step you, kind of, you have to do first before it's going to build successfully, right? Um, so you'll get an error if, if you didn't do this step, if you didn't make your library. Um, when it goes to try and link uh, your example assignment or any of the assignments. So, so all the assignments use the same common library. Um, it just takes a little while to compile here. So, so you know, we compile our test file um, and then we'll compile um, our file with the functions and then we'll try and link them together here. But um, if you get an error uh, about that it can't find the um, this L simulator exception, um, you basically have to, for, for the 430 class, you basically have to share, uh, build the shared library. You, you probably only have to do this once, right? But, but before you can do the example assignment or before you can successfully compile assignment one, uh, you have to change uh, into the directory called lib um, uh, libs change into libs all right and there's just one file in there but this is a library that's used by all of the assignments uh, in this class including the example assignment so just do a make in there um, and it will build this library okay so a dot a dot, a dot a you know, so another kind of secondary goal of this class is to learn a little bit about uh, the, you know, using tools, development tools from a Linux uh, system uh, and how linking and compiling work and things like that. So, so here, whenever you compile something, um, uh, you can uh, use the AR command to create what's known as an archive or a library. So this is a shared library that can then be linked into other projects or, or, or other code. So if you've ever, ever heard of a DLL, a dynamic load and link library, it's, it's the same kind of concept um, if you're a Windows person. Um, <clears throat> so, so these are just bits of code that, that um, I can reuse and I can link in with other um, 
projects that I'm building, right? So once you've built that and created this .a file, um, you can successfully link your 430 um, assignments. So now if we go back to the example one assignment and build, um, it should be able to link it together. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's searching for libraries to link through, link to by this dash capital L command here. Um, and it's linking in that simulator exception library. Um, and now that we've done that, we've successfully built the example project and you should be able to do the, the make um, tests to um, run the stuff. So. So yeah, I was planning on probably Wednesday, maybe kind of um, talking in a little bit more detail about the actual first assignment. So, but, but I'll happy I'll be happy to begin on that now if people want to ask questions about that. But but they are related. So you know, so we're working with the same hypothetical machine. So you definitely should get the problem set done first. Um, so hopefully that'll help you understand kind of how this hypothetical machine works and, and kind of what we're doing. And then we're just going to be building a simulation of this hypothetical machine um, in code for the first assignment. So. <clears throat> All right, let's see. And again, feel free if you have questions. So I've kind of, I think I've gone through the announcements here. I think we covered all these about the clarifications on the problem set. <clears throat> you can do these written problem sets. Uh, you can you can submit these pro probably you know any 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 uh, electronic. Uh, document format, sh you know, I should be able to, to read it. If I can't, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, but uh, you know, even, even if you want to do these by hand, you know, and, and uh, you will have to like maybe take a picture and, and uh, attach the pictures or scan them or something like that, but, but that's fine too. Like, just try and make certain they're readable if you're doing that, if you're taking a picture or scanning, but um, <clears throat> Um, so, Professor, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm a bit uh, confused on, so you said when you change the bind, like, uh, uh, those numbers are in hex, so you have to change them in binary, and then you you add the one in the first one to make it a negative number, right? Right. So, yep. so when we turn back into, turn it back into the hexadecimal number, so uh, would it be eight? Or negative? Yeah, so yeah, just to give it to you. So it's eight. So every four bits, you know, we're doing your binary, ends up with a, a single character or every character in hex. This is, a, is our hex number. Every character in hex represents four bits. So that's, that's why hex is often used in, in, uh, in output from programming and computers and things because it's relatively easy to translate the hex into uh, the actual bit pattern that it represents. You know, so, so every, every character represents a four uh, digit uh, hex, so, uh, a four oh, digit okay. binary so, pattern. So, so oh, uh, okay, I understood it now. Because uh, instead of writing the, the first 1000 as eight, I was writing it as one. So that's what I wanted to clarify. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the sign bit is the most significant bit. So it should be the, the bit zero now on the left. So yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, so, um, so I had a question again about the, uh, the, the fetching and execute. Um, so we already covered this, but, but, but yeah, once again, um, uh, so for some of the problems, once you've only got three instructions, so once you've executed those three instructions, you won't have a fourth instruction. So you're done at that point. 
uh, but some other problems, uh, you'll be using a jump instruction, um, and uh, so, so, so probably it's even an infinite loop, but in that case, you only have to execute, fill up the, the four cells, or, or the, the, sorry, the eight cells, or the four fetch execute cycles, and then you're done, so. Let's see. Oops. So yeah, this week, um, you know, besides the problem set, um, um, should be thinking about the program assignment. Uh, you should have, have um, you know, hopefully you're doing the readings, the assigned textbook readings. You know, I, I, I don't think just skimming is, is good enough usually for, for most people to do well on, on the exams and things. So you should have read the, the first chapter last week. Um, and you should be looking at, at our second chapter. So the second chapter uh, this week is where we're getting into, uh, actually getting into operating systems. So uh, the second chapter is all about um, defining, you know, so some of the big picture things about operating systems. So some of the concepts, um, some of the design trade-offs that you have to make when you're building an operating system. Some of the goals, you know, so performance goals and other things, uh, that's kind of really what chapter two is about. So both of these chapters are, are, you know, trying to give us a shared vocabulary and, and you know, so make, make sure that everybody has the same kind of idea of concepts, right? So, so in this class, you know, uh, although I'll talk about real operating systems a little bit, so especially Unix maybe and Windows, so how some of these things are actually implemented in real operating systems, but, but, but the, the, the textbook is written from the idea of a generic operating system, you know, with examples of specific ones usually at the end of the chapters. And you should read those, those examples. I sometimes take a question or two for our, our tests, um, you know, from those, so, but. Um, well, so hopefully, I mean, I think I've given some, a lot of hints now on the, the problem set. So hopefully everybody's gonna be square with that or mostly in good shape with that. Uh, So maybe I'll start thinking about this. So my plan is I'm not I'm, I'm not going to get into this deep here. Whoops. Um, uh, so on Wednesday I will definitely though kind of get you started. So I'll start writing together with you guys um, 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 the 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 first you know, the first function for the program assignment one basically right. So but you should start thinking about it, make certain that your dev box is up and ready and, and, and start looking at, at the assignment. Um, so maybe, um, Maybe I'll go over some of these. So, so we're, we're implementing the same hypothetical machine in the simulation. Um, so, and, and yeah, I can repeat these on, on Wednesday as well, a little bit. Um, so, wait, let me change it, you know, put this over on the left side here. Oops. So yes, yeah, so as, as I kind of describe in here, um, you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit about these these two different executables that are built. Um, a little bit more about what they do. 
right? So, so you don't have, you won't have to do a lot with the sim executable on this assignment. So if, if you get all the stuff implemented to get the, the unit test passing, you basically will have the simulation working, right? So, but if you look at this, the, the, the default, if you do a make all or, or just a make, which defaults to building all the executables, it'll end up building two um, separate executables for you. So one called tests and one called um, sim, so, or sorry, one called test without an S and one called sim, um, as we'll see here. So yeah, it always takes a little bit of time. The, the, the unit tests, this, this unit test framework that we're using is, is a bit, uh, so uh, it takes a, take a bit of time to compile, um, even though it's not really that big of, a, there's more complex unit testing frameworks out there. So this is a relatively streamlined compared to some, but, uh, but, but still, uh, even so, it, it um, always takes a while to, to, to compile the unit test ones here. So again, um, I'm, I think I've mentioned this before, it's good to kind of understand this. Uh, so you're getting kind of a flavor of, of how you, uh, you know, use development tools in a Linux environment to build stuff. So again, we're using the, the GNU compiler, G++ compiler in this case. So, you know, the, the, these first two lines, we're individually compiling source files. So, so, um, um, so we're invoking the compiler. Um, to compile the assignment one test on this first line and, and outputting this to an object file. And then the second one, we're, we're invoking the compiler to compile this hypothetical machine simulator file to an object file. And then this third one here, so what I was talking about in the assignment is that we link those together. So it looks similar. We're using the G++ compiler, but, but, but when you give it object files, it'll link those together into a final executable. So test in this case, right? Uh, and then at the end here, we build one more file, the assignment one sim to an object file. And then we link assignment one sim with, with the same hypothetical machine simulator dot O, link those together to end up with a second executable called sim, all right? So the result, if you do a directory listing, so, so again, D is just uh, uh, an ls dash al here. Um, so I've got an alias. Um, so if you do a directory listing after you do a make, you'll see that there's new, there's two executables, okay? And you can run these from the command line, um, so I can invoke my tests. So I, I, I'm pretty certain that I'd mentioned this before, but um, in case it's the first time you're seeing this. Um, so another thing about the way uh, the, a command line environment works is you have an env uh, environment variable called path. Right? So the environment variables work just like variables in a programming language. So it has a set of values, but the path is special. Uh, you, have, you have the same environment variable on a DOS command line and, and in many command line environments. Right? So this is a list of directories to search for an executable file. But notice it doesn't contain, oops, it doesn't contain, so my current working directory is this right now assignment, assignment ones, uh, all the way from my root here, right? Uh, my path doesn't uh, include that, right? So whenever you execute a command like ls or whatever, ls is probably a built-in command, but um, like, um, like the G++ compiler, uh, it searches this path to try and find that, that uh, command that you want to execute, right? And that's what the which does that we use or, or where in um, uh, from a DOS command line prompt. So if you ask which, it's, it's, it's telling me, okay, um, the command G++, uh, when I searched the path, I found it first in user bin, right? And if you invoke G++, it's going to use user bin G++. So I can always invoke a command by giving the full path. Oops. from the command line like that, right? And again, this is all the same from like a DOS command line prompt or, or a, um, uh, if you're using a different shell, like on, on um, Mac OS or whatever. So, so they'll have pretty similar concepts, right? So um, although one difference on a DOS command line prompt, by default, the DOS command line prompt has, 
searches your, your current directory as well, right? So what I was leading up to here is that um, um, although I can find G++ because user bin is on my path, um, uh, test, um, actually there is a test, there's an executable called test, but it's the, the, there's another executable called test and it's in user bin. So if, if I invoke test, it won't be running the, the, the same one. Uh, but, but sim might be a better one. So there's probably no program called sim on my system. So if I, if I search for sim and if I try to run sim, uh, it'll tell you that the command is not found. So that's because uh, on a Unix system, uh, your current directory isn't in your path by default. I, I could always add that. So I could do something like say, path equals the current path plus dot. Okay, so, so here dollar path is how, I, um, is, is how I access what the current value is of my path environment variable. Um, and by doing this, I, I'm going to reassign, this is, this is in like any programming language, if you say value equals value plus something, you're, you're, you're accessing the current value of a variable, adding something to it, and reassigning it back into the variable. So we're doing a similar thing here. So, so variables in a bash shell are, are basically strings by default. So here I'm going to add in the string dot to the end of my path. Oops. So now if I, if I look at my path, it's, it's got all the path I had before, but dot in there. So that'll allow it to search also my current directory, right? So now if I search for sim, it, it would find it. And if I want to, um, I can invoke the, the sim. And this is invoking the, the sim that we, um, that we built for our assignment one project, okay? Although again, you have to be careful because like the test, now that I'm thinking about it, so, so it searches these directories in the order that you have them on your path. So, so uh, again, the, if I try and invoke test to run my unit tests in my current directory that we have, uh, it won't do the one that you want, even though I add it to my path, because it's gonna invoke the one in user bin test, the, the first one that it finds on your path. So, so this one here. So if I invoke my test, it won't actually run my unit tests. Okay. Uh, let me set my path back to what it was without the um, colon on there. Oops. All of that's kind of a long-winded way of saying, um, so if I really want to run the test or the sim that's in this directory, my current directory where I'm at, I have two options. I can specify the full path name to run the program. So I can say slash home, slash vagrant, repos, CSCI430, assignment, assignment one. All right, so that's the actual full path name of this test executable in my current directory. And that'll, that'll actually run the unit test that we built. Uh, and I can do the same thing for sim, all right? But yeah, I mean, typing out that whole, whole um, the, the, the full path from the root all the way to the file gets kind of annoying, even, even if you learn to use up and down arrows, so I don't, don't have to retype everything. I can just pull up the previous command and, and edit if I want to. Um, so what you'll see, most people use this as a shorthand. So you can also specify a relative path. Um, to, to invoke a command. So dot means current directory in shells like bash. So saying dot slash sim means starting at my current directory, follow the path, um, you know, just from my current directory um, and, and find a file named sim and try and run it. Right? So anyway, that invokes sim. And, and, you know, because there's another version, there's another command called test on my path already, that's the only way to invoke test is either using a relative name or an absolute name, or else I have to modify my path and put my current directory before uh, this other version of test here. So anyway, yeah, so I can invoke 
So the reason, if you look at my um, help videos that we put this a dot slash whenever we try to invoke the test or the sim um, is for that reason. So, so the, the current directory isn't on the path by default. So if I want to run the, the test or the sim executable that I built, I have to give a full path name or give a relative path name to the command to run it. So yeah, so, so the, the first assignment description here, um, that's a little bit of what it's discussing uh, uh, here at the top. So. Um, so, so yeah, the, 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 the two executables you have, the, the test runs a set of unit tests, okay? So, and I'll talk more about this on Wednesday, but um, uh, by, uh, when you first build the, your, your pro, your, um, as we already did, you know, your assignment should build, but the, the test won't be failing. Won't, won't, won't be succeeding. Some, some or most of them will be failing, right? So if you run test um, and don't provide any uh, command line flags, by default, it runs all the tests and it displays just the, the failing tests, right? So a lot of them will be failing here. In fact, so many fail that it kind of bothers them to scroll through there. So I often like to use what's known as a pipe so they say dot slash test, and then th this will take the output from test and will redirect that as input to a tail command. Um, and, or sorry, not tail, um, uh, a less command. So less is a pager, which I might've mentioned before. So I can use this, um, um, I can use up and down arrow now, and it'll start at the top of the output. And I can go down by one line by go doing down arrow and up by one line. I can go down by a page by doing page down and up by a page by doing page up. Although we do lo lose the, the nice coloring, which can be helpful to identify stuff here, right? You can use Q. So when you're in the less pager, just, just hit the Q key and it'll, it'll quit out of there. So I often uh, make an alias. So if you use the um, dash, uh, use color equals yes. Um, it, it'll give you these color coding, but then you have to add another flag to less, uh, which is, um, I think dash R, raw control characters. So, so yeah, there, that, that'll give us the, uh, allow us to use the pager, um, but also, you know, uh, uh, get the color coding, okay? So again, you know, so if that's kind of going past you here, it, it, you'll get a little bit more about using command line tools and flags and things uh, in this class from, from doing stuff. I might even make a few labs for people to do um, on various topics, so. But um, I often just make that like an alias. So like T for test, real simply, right? So now I can just do T um, and it will run the test, make the stuff in color, send it out to the, the pager um, so I can scroll through more easily the results of my unit tests here. So, all right. so, so next Wednesday, I'll probably be doing all this stuff from Visual Studio instead of doing this from a command line terminal, but you can do them either way. So anyway, that, that's the two executables. The, the, the tests are the unit tests. So you're, the, the first thing you're gonna be doing for assignments for this class um, is you'll start at the first failing unit test and you'll have to write a function or implement a function. So the, the get memory base address in this case. So you'll have to implement that function to get this test to pass, right? And you'll just do that many times repeatedly to get all these functions. And then for this first assignment, once you get all these, these unit tests to be passing, uh, you don't have anything further. That, that, sh that should be enough to, to get the system simulations to run, right? Um, and I, I, I probably won't talk about those today. We'll, I'll talk more about those probably next week um, or maybe a bit on Wednesday. So.
All right. So yeah, I mean, that's kind of the beginning stuff. So now we're kind of set up to actually open up our first assignment project folder and, and start working on kind of the, um, the first task. So for these, um, these assignment descriptions that I give you, um, basically, I, so what you'll normally do is come down here to the section named unit test. I mean, of course, you should read the, the, the description, but come down here and, and uh, I'll, I'll lay it out step by step. So the very first thing you need to do is go in, find the place where you, you're supposed to write the function initialize memory and implement it, you know, and, and, and so on. All right. Let me see if I can think of anything else. Well, I got the assignment description up. All right, yeah, so I don't know if there's anything else. Uh, any questions that that's invoked or people still working on the, or about the, you know, the written problem set. So, oh, I know one thing I could maybe show also. So, so again, th these are invoking the, the we're gonna be, implementing a simulator of, of the same hypothetical machine that you're doing, working on the problem set here for. Um, if you look in here, so, so this is beginning to talk a little bit about what the simulator does. Um, so if you look in the assignment one structure, there's, there's a subdirector under, under all these assignments, we'll have a, a subdirector called sim files. Um, um, but um, in particular, for example, there's a program 01.sim. You can open up with the plain text editor here, for example. So what this is then is, is so what the simulator does basically, if, if you give it one of these, the program one simulator file, it'll open and read these up. So, so the first three things do the kind of the, the left hand side. So this specifies, uh, did I close? Uh, I guess I closed it. Um, so, so like for each of these problems, when you did them by hand, you had this information. So you had the information of what was in the program counter, the accumulator, um, and then you also have the information about what was in memory, right? Um, so that, that's what these first instructions, so the first two instructions tell you what the, uh, what the starting contents of the program counter are. The second one is what the contents of the accumulator are, is at the start of the simulation. Uh, and then here, so, so we've set it up so we can simulate different ranges of memory. So here what we're saying is that this, this simulation is going to simulate a memory that has a starting address of 300 and an end address of 1,000. And then we, we specify, so, so any memory addresses that we don't give a value for will be, should be initialized to zero in your initialized memory. Um, but, but, but for the ones that we specify, these will get initialized to these particular values. So, and in fact, this one should be the same as the first um, um, problem set problem, or, or, or maybe not this one, but, but one of these I've got in the sim files um, um, actually, oops. Oh yeah, it's probably all these program problems at one, two, three, four. These, these are probably the actual um, ones that you're working on by hand in, in the first problem set. So, um, so yeah, this should be the first one, uh, your, your first problem set problem, I think. So, so the, the result is if you get the simulator working and you run it on this one, you should get the same result as when you simulate it by hand, basically. All right, yeah, so I think that's all I kind of wanted to go over here unless um, I've got uh, any kind of last minute questions here for today's sessions.
if that jogs has jogged anybody's curiosity about something, let me know. Otherwise, I think I'm going to go ahead and end the session today. So everybody have a good day. Keep working on your problem sets. Um, yeah, start looking at the assignment if you haven't already. And yeah, I'll see you guys on Wednesday then.